We are the sound of the branch crackling in the midnight forest. We are the hellish shadows cast by the leaves under the eerie moonlight. We are that scream you could have sworn you've heard. That mysterious being that makes animals quiver in fear in the dark. We are the children of the forest. With a name, you might think of us as benevolent, harmless, maybe even go as far to say as helpful. Mortal men belittle us with their implausible depictions of our race. These nice elf-like beings that merely skip through the forest and talk to fairies. The human race is misled about our purpose, but the very nature of our existence, we're not guardian angels. We're hell's worst nightmare. We are always one with the forest. We've been lurking on Earth since the beginning of time. Millions of years of evolution have passed by before the trees large and nurturing could sate our seeds. Don't be mistaken though, we are parasites incarnate. The forest used to be a truly majestic place at sight, showered with fairies and other illuminated creatures. That's right, fairies. The leaves used to glow softly at the night. Those nights were long gone before humans ever came into the picture. Our goal had been the dispersion of dark forces from the beginning. With those dark forces, we took over the forest. All of the nocturnal beauty had faded. We needed its energy to survive. As time passed, our power began to diminish. Seeing that the natural beauty had faded, of course, our next logical step was the extermination of animals. We had consumed the energy of a few before. The humans began to notice. The presence of the advanced humans led to our fate. We were so busy in basking in our power from beauty that we had vanquished, that during the time of the humans had evolved from monkeys to these super beings that could easily so overpower us, it's, it's crazy. They soon noticed the predicament of their food source, or rather, lack thereof. One night, we were consuming one of their precious animals via the dark forces and they spotted us. They carried weapons of wood and stone, which proved superior over our magic. We took many of them, and the psychological damage was worse than physical. After the dust had cleared, however, our numbers were in the mere twenties. So we hid in the forest. Our group grew to fifteen, as there was a gross lack of energy. We were dying. We came up with a new way to feed off the weak. Human children were ultimately determined as our prey. They're obtuse, narrow-minded, and very naive. Which made them the perfect targets. We vastly overpower them as well, so there's no chance of escape. We live in the forest to this day, but we are not limited to forests. Any reasonable amount of dense underbrush can serve as a temporary forage for ungurgitation. So next time you hear a creepy sound coming from a group of trees, it's not the wind blowing, it's not your imagination, it's us. I had a job at 4Kids a few years back. The company did that poorly made Sonic X dub. I didn't care about dubs though. I only wanted the money, and I hated the show anyway. Sonic was dead to me by then. On the internet, I heard a rumor that Sega wanted to continue the horrible abominated wreck, but 4Kids refused to give copyright for the show. So it was discontinued. I heard a colleague of mine and the boss talking about the future of Sonic X and them refusing to give Cosmo, the character of the third season, to Bioware. I wanted to ignore the conversation and proceed on copying my papers, when suddenly the word Episode 79 fell. Okay, I hated that anime so much because of that pink hedgehog, 
Amy Rhodes, who was constantly chasing after Sonic. Their high-pitched voice was just annoying. But I knew there were only 78 episodes. I stopped and walked over to the two, asking about the episode. But my colleague told me they already got rid of it. Eh, I shrugged it off and went back to work. At 4pm, I could finally go home. But when I passed the trash containers by the facility, curiosity took over me and I peeked inside. I noticed a DVD case without any cover, but a CD inside. I took it out and brushed off some dirt. The DVD had episode 79 written on it in black permanent marker. Bingo! Found the lost episode. Looking around, I didn't see anyone watching me, so I took DVD case with me. I wasn't really excited about the episode and hoped it wasn't some stupid sonomy crap polluting my TV screen. I only wanted to pull the episode onto my computer and post it to YouTube to gain some fame. I got home and the first thing I did was put my bag away and get myself some dinner. For some reason, I was still really hungry. When I came back to work the next week on a Wednesday, I remember the DVD case still lying around somewhere in my living room. I walked over and opened it. It said Project Sonic Episode 79 on it, also with permanent marker. I noticed it was starting to rain. I closed my window to make sure nothing gets wet. After I cleaned the DVD, it was in the trash after all, I walked over to my HD TV and put the DVD inside my DVD player. The DVD started instantly with the well-known intro from the third season of Sonic X, the annoying theme song blared in my speakers. Nothing odd, until I saw that there was actually the Japanese logo instead of the English one. I guess I snagged the non-dub version. I was so glad not to see the fucked up edits four kids dared to do. I could understand a lot of Japanese, being a proud weeaboo. I'm sure you knew what I'm talking about. The intro ended with each character posing in a group picture with Eggman in the background. I noticed Chris wasn't in the group picture. I guess it was some tweak since Chris left in episode 78. Just as the image faded to black, a loud thunderclap managed to cause a power failure. It was only my house when I asked my neighbors about it. My laptop was still working since I left it and now ran on battery. So I manually opened the disc platform and put the disc into my laptop. Surprisingly, it didn't play the DVD, but showed the insides of it. Computer files. Next to the DVD's main file, I noticed a folder called Preza. Confused by the name of the mysterious folder, I opened it out of curiosity, and it showed an alternate DVD file. When I double-clicked it, it started to play the file, soon to be disappointed by a constant black screen. But I waited patiently for the beginning of the intro. But it didn't come. I've waited about five minutes before moving my mouse to close the file. I did not forget! Ah! I jumped at the distorted female voice as the screen flashed red for a split second. I closed out the file. That moment nearly gave me a heart attack. Jeez. The thunderstorm outside my window was getting worse and louder. It was getting closer. Since everything was already shut off, I didn't bother about it and exited the folder to play the original file played the intro, Crystal Missing. The episode started with Amy and Cream, sitting by a table with Vanilla. Vanilla's Cream's mother, if you didn't know. They were enjoying cake and tea. I was disappointed when Amy was about to cry for Sonic's love again. Jeez. Vanilla suddenly slammed her fist down on the table and leaned close to Amy. You don't know anything about love, you moron. Cream cringed and back away, cheese making the usual chow noises. Looking sad as Cream hugged him close. That's how I lost him. That's how she lost who? Oh, wait. I'm sure you know Cream never had a father. Thus, Vanilla has no husband. I guess it wasn't true love then. Amy taunted Vanilla instead of being reasonable. The camera zoomed in on Cream, who blinked as the flashback started. It was Cream and Vanilla walking along a park. Cream was holding a picnic basket. After a second, she asked her mother where her father was. Vanilla glared at Cream, who cringed and became quiet. They returned to the current scene with Vanilla, slapping Amy across the face. How dare you speak of... like that? The name was interrupted by the screen going black at that exact moment. I was disappointed. Vanilla continued, Amy now on the floor, staring up at her. He was a hero. A hero you will never be. He gave us life for all of us. Amy scoffed and got up, pouting angrily as she dusted her dress off. No one's a bigger hero than Sonic. 
Vanilla pointed towards the exit. Leave! Amy oddly waved her hand at Vanilla before exiting the building. Cream pleaded for Amy to come back, but the scene already showed Amy walking away from Vanilla's house. Vanilla pulled out a tissue, and she started to cry. Cream walked over, worried about her mother. Vanilla bent down to Cream, gently hugged her, crying softly. Cream looked over at Vanilla and asked the question I had on my mind. Who is my father? As Vanilla sat down and pulled Cream onto her lap, the screen cut to black again. I sighed softly in disappointment, but patiently waited for the screen to return. I... I did not forget what you did to me. Jeez. This time I didn't really jump. It was the same female voice that scared me in the other file, but much calmer and less distorted. It was soft and sounded bad. It was not Vanilla or any other voice actor. I shrugged it off and continued to stare at my black screen. The screen returned, and Amy knocking on Sonic's door. Sonic sat up on the couch, his feet on the table. As he heard Amy knock, he groaned and sit up straight. Ugh, it's her again, he muttered in an annoying tone, as he got up and walked over to answer the door. Sonic, you didn't forget about our date tonight, right? Amy smiled before turning to just walk off. Sonic face palm before closing the door again. He walked back, one on the couch sitting down, noticeably sad. He looked up again at something, and the screen turned black again. Oh, come on, I muttered angrily, but I decided to wait again, hoping none of these messages would pop up. But it did. Murdered me. The voice whispered this time. A picture flashed for a split second. Being on my computer, I could reverse the player to the exact point when the picture flashed, and I was quite surprised by what I saw. It was Princess Sally. She didn't have a new style or anything. She looked like what she did in the much better cartoon show Sonic the Hedgehog. She was staring at the screen. Her face was bland and empty. She was missing her mouth, and the whole picture had a red tint. Especially her. Now crimson eyes, I snagged a screenshot of it. I imported it to MS Paint and saved it to my computer. I still have the file. It's called Sally PNG. I continued to play the file. It took a while for the screen to return again, and the picture of Sally disturbed me, but also sort of made me happy. Did Sega not forget about Princess Sally after all? The screen returned. It had a faint white border to it to show as a flashback scene. Does anybody remember Rosie the Rascal, the actual sweet little girl before that pink bitch showed up? Yeah. She was walking along the forest, humming a playful tune. I think she was voiced by Cream's voice actor only using a different voice pitch. Rosie entered a house that I couldn't really recognize. It was a wooden hut with a roof. The camera cut to inside. Most of the things were made of wood. At first, I thought it was supposed to be something tribal, but then I noticed the handheld computer. Nicole, on the small round table. It hit me. The camera cut to Princess Sally, who looked very pretty in the Sonic X style. She was staring out the window. I hope Sonic will return from his mission soon. I'm worried about him. Sally's voice was the voice from the messages and the black screens. Rosie stood there, looking at Sally in the background. Uh, are you Sally Acorn? Rosie asked curiously as Sally whipped around, startled by Rosie. Hmm? And who might you be? Rosie's smile faded and her expression was blank. Sally blinked a few times, but she answered anyway. Yes, I am. The camera zoomed on Rosie's face, a front shot, which isn't usual. And you love Sonic, right? And Sonic loves you? Sally seemed irritated at that, standing up. Who are you? She asked again, sounding unnerved. Rosie didn't stop staring at Sally with those hateful, brownish-red eyes. Die. The screen cut to black a final time. Loving Sally, I yelled out with dismay. Why would Sega do this? To me? To Sally? I've waited. Tears welling up in my eyes. Be there. Please, be there. Live. The file ended. I let my head sink down in my own arms, sobbing softly. Sally would never come back. Those bastards! at the company, murdered her, and nobody would remember her. 
I stayed that way for a few more minutes, realizing I still had the other file. Hoping Sally would still be alive on it, I clicked the Prisa folder and opened the second DVD file. It was the black screen like before. I've waited, still sniffling, being too lazy to blow my nose. The Sally image flashed again. Sonic. Sally's voice whispered. Another image flashed across the screen of my laptop. It was the same image, but the white part of her eyes were gone. Yes. Another picture of Sally. Now her pupils are missing, leaving her eyes as empty black voids. No. The picture stayed this time, following by long silence. I was about to close the file, starting to sob again, but then I noticed the picture was changing. Black, gooish tears ran down Sally's cheeks. Slowly, very slowly. Suddenly, a loud screech interrupted me. A reddish light was now, and her pupils staring right at me. I jumped, and those red pupils followed mine wherever I moved. Ready. The image disappeared, and the screen went black again. I sighed and looked towards the ground. But soon after, I heard the sound of the wind blowing from my speakers. I looked at the screen again. Sonic was there, standing in the middle of a graveyard. He bent down to one of the tombstones, which was empty. The camera showed his sad face and said, Good night, my princess. In a gentle, loving tone, as he set some flowers beside her tombstone before he left. Right as Sonic was about out of sight, Amy came over, looking down at the empty tombstone angrily. She scoffed. I can't believe he still won't give up. Before she raised her hammer and yelled before smashing the tombstone and the file ended. I sighed sadly and closed the DVD player. When I looked at the files, the DVD files were gone. Instead, there was a text file. I didn't really want to, but I opened it anyway. It said, Amy was not supposed to exist. She was created to replace Sally. Enough. I closed the text file in the folder, but I didn't have time to recover. As I was staring at Princess Sally replacing my desktop. <laughs> Do any of you remember those Mickey Mouse cartoons from the 1930s? The ones that were just put on DVD a few years ago? Well, I hear that one was unreleased to even the most avid classic Disney fans. According to sources, it's nothing special. It's just a continuous loop, like the Flintstones, of Mickey walking past six buildings that goes on for two or three minutes before fading out. Unlike the cutesy tunes put in the cartoon, though, it's not like that at all. It's just a constant banging on a piano for a minute before the white noise comes in for the remainder of the film. It wasn't the jolly old Mickey we've come to love either. Mickey wasn't dancing, not even smiling, just kind of walking, as if you and I were walking, with a normal facial expression. But for some reason, his head tilted to the side as he kept this dismal look. Up until a year or two ago, everyone believed that after it cut the black, that was it. When Leonard Moulton was reviewing the cartoon to put it in the complete series, he decided it was too junk to be on the DVD, but he wanted to have a digital copy due to the fact it was a creation by Walt. 
when he had digitalized the version up and the computer took the file, he noticed something. The cartoon was actually nine minutes and four seconds long. This is what my source emailed me in full. After it cut to black, it stayed until the sixth minute before back to Mickey walking. The sound was different this time. It was a murmur. It wasn't a language, but more like a gurgled cry as the noise got more indistinguishable and louder over the next minute. The picture began to get weird. The sidewalk started to go in directions that seemed impossible based off the physics of Mickey's walking. The dismal face of the mouse was slowly curling into a smirk. On the seventh minute, the murmur turned into a blood-curdling scream, and the picture was getting more and more obscure. Colors were happening that shouldn't have even been possible at the time. Mickey's face began to fall apart. His eyes rolled to the bottom of his chin like two marbles in a fishbowl. And his curled smile was pointing upward to the left side of his face. The buildings became a rubble, floating in midair, and the sidewalk was still impossibly navigating in warped directions. A few seeming inconceivable with what we, as humans, know about direction. Mr. Moulton got disturbed and left the room, sending an employee to finish the video and take notes on everything happening up until the last second, and afterward immediately store the disc in the cartoon vault. The distorted screams lasted about eight minutes and a few seconds in, and then it abruptly cuts to Mickey Mouse's face at the credits at the end of every video. It sounded like a broken music box was playing in the background. This happened for about 30 seconds, and whatever was in the remaining 30 seconds I haven't been able to get a sliver of information about. From a security guard working under me who was making rounds outside of the room. I was told after the last frame the employee stumbled out of the room with pale skin saying, real suffering is not known. He said that seven times before taking the guard's pistol out, offing himself on the spot. The thing I can get out of Leonard Moulton was that the last frame was a piece of Russian text that roughly said, the sights of hell brings its viewers back in. As far as I know, no one else has seen it. But there have been dozens of attempts on getting the file on rapid share by employees inside the studios, all whom have been promptly terminated of their jobs. Whether it got online or not is up for debate, but if rumors serve me right, it's online somewhere under suicidemouse.avi. If you ever find a copy of this film, I want you to never view it, and to contact me by phone immediately, regardless of the time. When a Disney death is covered up as well as this, it means this has to be something huge. Please get back to me. I have yet to find a copy of this, but it's out there somewhere. I know it. Thirteen Curves is a nickname given to the Cedarville Road in Syracuse, New York, USA, due to its dangerous curves. More than 70 years ago, a couple on their honeymoon were driving down a road. It was late that night, and they were both getting very tired. They were on their way to the hotel to stay the night. In the morning, they planned to take a drive to New York City to further their honeymoon celebration. The wife, having been up since the day before, had already fallen asleep in the passenger seat. The husband was driving in the car, and he was struggling to keep his eyes open. And that is when he succumbed to drowsiness and fell asleep in the wheel. 
car went off the road and smashed into a tree. The wife and husband were both sent flying from the car. The wife, barely holding on to life, crawled over the ground looking for the husband. When emergency teams arrived, they both found the wife with a bloody trail behind her, leading from where she landed. A police officer ran to her and held her in his arms. She was still just slightly alive, and with her last words, asked where her husband was. The emergency teams never recovered her husband's body. It is said that the wife haunts this road. If you go driving on the street that night, you could see her ghost wandering aimlessly looking for a beloved husband. I'm sure you've heard of Skype. It's a free instant messaging program that allows voice and webcam chat with people with the world and all over. I've been using it to keep track of my old friends. We all went to college a fortnight ago. Last week, I was talking to Annie, a girl I used to go to school with. We'd both just moved into our flats. We were both single and the first semester hadn't yet begun, so we found ourselves with plenty of time to chat. Usually we'd Skype at least once a day. The stuff we talked about isn't hugely interesting. She brought up new headphones, I'd watched The Princess Bride for the first time. It was a familiar company amidst the time, you know? Anyway, it was Tuesday morning. I'd been clubbing the previous night. I was pretty groggy and hungover, but I'd awoken to the plant-lived buzzing of a Skype call, cursing at the fact I left my laptop on. I stumbled out of bed. Ugh. Hello? My bleary eyes struggled against the painfully bright monitor in front of me. Annie was, of course, dressed up and grinning, sporting her headphones. She gave me a cheery wave, in which I responded with a half-smile. <laughs> well, aren't you the life of the party this morning? <laughs> you should have seen me last night. My dance moves put the club to shame. <laughs> Big fish, little fish doesn't impress anyone. Hey, don't you have an introduction meeting with your tutor today? I glanced at my calendar, but the ink refused to stop squirming on the page. I assumed she was right, but even the small amount of sunlight that stepped into my gloomy domain under the curtains was eye-watering. Ugh, yeah, fuck that. What about you? What are you doing today? Hoping to get a call from Erin. She just took off yesterday, during a fire drill. She left a letter on her desk saying that she was going home. Which one's Erin again? I asked half serious. You know how it is. Your friends talk about so many people that they just blur together after a while. Annie made an unimpressed face. My flatmate? She lives across the corridor from me. She just vanished. I mean, it's only been a day, but we were thinking about calling her parents just to check up on her. Yeah. Do it. Better safe than sorry, right? Before she could reply, there was a sudden shrieking of an alarm. Annie said something that drowned out my noise, and I covered my ears wincing. What'd you say? I asked. She had to shout directly in the microphone. I said, that's the fire alarm. I'd better go outside or the warden will have a fit and make us do the whole thing again. What time should I call back? I asked, raising my voice as much as my pounding headache would allow. Don't worry, I'll only be gone for like five minutes. I'll just leave Skype on. With that, she was gone, pulling her headphones off and placing them on the keyboard. After a few minutes, the alarm cut out. Then the door opened. It wasn't Annie. Though, it was wearing a blue boiler suit, stained with paint, a beanie-style hat, and mask made from bleached skull from some kind of goat or sheep. My eyes were drawn to its hand. However, a rubber glove wrapped around a hook. The kind you see at the counter of a butcher shop's. For a few seconds, I just sat there, numbly wandering. If this was Annie playing a creepy joke on me, then I snapped into action. What the fuck are you doing? I yelled. Who are you? There was no response to the figure. It couldn't hear me. The headphones were still plugged into Anne's laptop. Instead, it simply stood there, 
taking in the room. Ten seconds later, I began to approach the desk. I fumbled for my phone. I had to warn Annie. I selected her number on speed dial, not taking my eyes off the figure of the screen. It was peering intently into the camera, eyes glittering behind empty sockets. The masked figure froze, then slowly and deliberately, it reached its free hand off camera. I squinted against the pixelated image, then my heart sank. It was Annie's phone. She'd left it on her desk. The figure cocked its head to the side, throwing me what I presume was supposed to be a pitying look before it hit the off button of the mobile device and placed it on her laptop. It reached into its pocket, it produced something white and dropped atop her keyboard. I only saw it for a second, but it looked like an envelope. It then wandered across the wardrobe, opened the door and climbed outside, stooping to fit. It hesitated as it did so, and turned directly at the webcam. The light caught its teeth, though they were flashing at me in a cruel grin. Then it pulled the wardrobe shut. I glanced down at my phone. I had to call the police. No question of that, but even as I dialed the first nine, I realized the futility of the jester. There would be the bother of them finding and contacting the department of Annie City, 50 miles away. <sighs> Whatever I called anyway. Your three to the emergency services. Which service do you require? Uh, yeah, I need to talk to- I paused mid-sentence. I paused because the door had opened and Annie hurried inside. Her hair was wet from the rain. She smiled as she approached the webcam. I yelled as loud as I could for her to run, and I felt tears pinching the corners of my eyes. Annie didn't hear me. She sat down, picked up her headphones, and began to adjust the strap length. Over her shoulder, the wardrobe stirred. Hello? Sir, which service do you require? I work at a recently built city parking garage and a transit hub. The late night is my job to lock everything up until the morning. And I have to patrol the dark building alone with just a radio linked to the local police department. It's a very simple procedure that takes maybe 10 minutes to lock up everything with 15 minute walkthroughs every hour. At roughly 3 o'clock in the morning though, I'm very tired from my 8 hour shift. Four more hours to go. I drag myself through the security center. Fancy talk, <laughs> with a chair and monitors, and begin to ascent through the ramps. I listen to my footsteps echo and realize that they seem quieter than usual. I could smell a typical putrid smell of the city. It was the fermenting feces in the trash can from the numerous homeless. We had to lock down public bathrooms to prevent damage, theft, and vandalism. And most importantly, deaths from people overdosing in the middle of the night. I finally got to the top of the floor and summoned the elevator. I placed my forehead against the door, feeling the cold air rushing up through the elevator shaft as it reaches my floor. With a satisfying ding, I stepped in. I got to ground floor and then continued back to the office. I fling the door open and head inside running for the cold office room. The door usually gets hung up a little, so a swift heel, I slam it shut and make my way to my desk. The computer that runs the cameras is worthy of being called ancient. I'm pretty sure they don't even make them anymore. Not to mention the internet's camera runoff is so slow they take forever to update. So I sat there, with my new favorite pastime, watching myself walk around from all the lag. 
Yeah, that's how far behind it was. I sat there watching myself drudge through the stupidly hot weather. I laughed to myself as I watched my hand land against the cold steel of the top elevator floors. As the doors open and the light floods area around me, my blood went ice cold. There was a man standing no more than six feet away, just staring at me. As I entered the elevator, I headed for the stairs, already vaulting down the steps. My heart races as I watch the camera as he hits the floor. I hit the fourth, the third, almost seamlessly. He's keeping up perfect time with the elevator. My ears begin to boil as I feel the blood rush to my head. I'm having a hard time breathing. I watch as the elevator doors close and he begins following me again, closer and closer after each turn of the corner. As I watch, as I fling the door open and he catches it, heading in right behind me my heart pounding in my eardrums. He's inside the building. I keep watching, knowing I should look away. I can't find him. Then I see why. I kick the door shut in his face, which means... Oh my god. As I search the room, I eventually discover it's just me down here. I radio a few officers to come, and they sweep the building. They gave me a slap on the wrist for not paying attention and left. The rest of the night I stayed in that room. I watched the camera diligently, but I never saw him again. Now every time I go to work, I can never shake a feeling I'm being watched. Bedtime is supposed to be a happy event for a tired child. For me, it was terrifying. While some children might complain about being put to bed before they finished watching their favorite film or playing their favorite video game, when I was a child, nighttime was something to truly fear. Somewhere in the back of my mind, it still is. As someone who is trained in the sciences, I cannot prove that what happened to me was objectively real. But I can swear what I experienced was genuine horror, a fear which in my life, I'm glad to say, has never been equaled. I will relate it to you as best I can. Make of it what you will, but I'll be glad just to get it off my chest. I can't remember exactly when it started, but my apprehension towards falling asleep seemed to correspond with being moved to my own room. I was eight years old at the time, until then I'd shared a room quite happily, with my older brother. As is perfectly understandable for a boy of five years my senior, my brother eventually wished to get a room on his own. As a result, I was given a room in the back of the house. It was small, narrow, large enough for a bed and a couple chest drawers, but not much else. I couldn't really complain, because even at that age, I understood that we did not have a large house, and I had no real reason to be disappointed as my family was both loving and caring. It was a happy childhood, during the day at least. A solitary window looked out onto our main garden. Nothing out of the ordinary, but even during the day, the light that crept in the room seemed almost hesitant. As my brother was given a new bed, I was given the bunk beds in which we used to share. While I was upset about sleeping on my own, I was excited at the thought of being able to sleep on the top bunk which seemed far more adventurous to me. From the very first night, I remember a strange feeling of unease creeping slowly in the back of my mind. I lay on the top bunk, staring at my action figures and cars across the green and blue carpet. As imaginary battles and adventures took place between the toys on the floor, I couldn't help but feel my eyes being slowly drawn towards the bottom bunk, as if something was moving in the corner of my eye. Something which did not wish to be seen. The bunk was empty, impeccably made with a dark blanket tucked in neatly, partially covering the two rather bland white pillows. I didn't think anything of it at the time. I was a child, 
and the noise slipping under my door from my parents' television bathed me in a warm sense of safety and well-being. I fell asleep. <laughs> when you awaken from a deep sleep to something moving or stirring, it can take a few moments for you to understand what is truly happening. The fog of sleep hangs over your eyes and ears, even when lucid. Something was moving. There was no doubt about that. At first, I wasn't sure what it was. Everything was dark, almost pitch black, but there was enough light creeping in from outside to outline the narrowly suffocating room. Two thoughts appeared in my mind almost simultaneously. The first was that my parents were in bed because the rest of the house lay in darkness and silence. The second thought turned to a noise, a noise which obviously woken me. As the last cobwebs of sleep withered from my mind, the noise took a more familiar form. Sometimes, the simplest of sounds can be the most unnerving. A cold wind rustling through a tree outside, a neighbor's footsteps uncomfortably close, or, in this case, the simple sound of bedsheets rustling in the dark. That was it, the bedsheets rustling in the dark, as if some disturbed sleeper was attempting to get all too comfortable in the bottom bunk. I lay there, in disbelief, thinking that that noise was either my imagination, or perhaps my pet cat finding somewhere comfortable to spend the night. It was then that I noticed my door. Shut. As it had been when I fell asleep. Perhaps my mom had checked in on me, and the cat sneaked in my room then. Yes, that must be it. I turned to face the wall, closing my eyes, in the vain hope that I could just fall back to sleep. As I moved, the rustling noise from underneath me ceased. I thought that I must have disturbed my cat, but quickly I realized that the visitor in the bottom bunk was much less mundane than a pet trying to sleep, and much, much more sinister, as if alerted to and disgruntled by my presence. The disturbed sleeper began to toss and turn violently, like a child having a tantrum on their bed. I could hear the sheets twist and turn with increasing ferocity. Fear then gripped me. Not like a subtle sense of unease I had experienced earlier, but now, potent and terrifying. My heart raced as my eyes panicked, scanning the almost impenetrable darkness. I let out a cry, as most little boys do. I instinctively shouted for my mother. I could hear something stir on the other side of the house, but as I began to sigh, a sigh of relief, because I knew my parents were coming to save me. The bunk bed suddenly started to shake violently, as if I was gripped by an earthquake. Scraping against the wall, I could hear the sheets below me thrashing round, as if tormented by malice. I did not want to jump down to safety, as I feared the thing at the bottom bunk would reach down and grab me, pulling me into the darkness. So I stayed there, with white knuckles, clenching my own blanket and a shroud of protection. The door finally and thankfully burst open, and I lay bathed in light, while the bottom bunk, the resting place of my unwanted visitor, lay empty and peaceful. I cried and my mother consoled me. Tears of fear followed by relief streamed down my face. Yet though all the horror and relief, I did not tell her why I was so upset. I cannot explain it, but it was as if though Whatever had been in that bottom bunk would return if I even as much as spoke of it, or uttered a single syllable of its existence. Whether that was the truth or not, I didn't want to know. But as a child, I felt as if the unseen menace remained close, listening. My mother lay in the empty bunk, promising to stay there until morning. Eventually my anxiety diminished, tiredness pushed me back towards sleep. But I remained restless, waking several times momentarily to the sound of rustling bedsheets. I remember the next day wanting to go anywhere, be anywhere, but that narrow, suffocating room. It was Saturday and I played outside, quite happily with my friends. Although our house was not large, we were lucky to have a long, sloping garden in the back. We played there often, as much of it was overgrown and we could hide in the bushes climbed the huge sycamore tree, which towered above all else, and easily imagined ourselves 
in the throes of a grand adventure in some untamed exotic land. As fun as it all was, occasionally my eye would turn to the small window. Ordinary, slight, but for me, that thin boundary was looking a bit strange. A cold pocket of dread. Outside, the lush green surroundings of our garden, filled with the smiling faces of my friends, could not extinguish the creeping feeling crawling its way up my spine. Each hair standing on end. The feeling of something in that room, watching me play, waiting for the night when I would be alone, eagerly filled with hate. It may sound strange to you, but by the time my parents ushered me back into the room for the night, I said nothing. I didn't protest. I didn't even make an excuse as to why I couldn't sleep there. I simply, sullenly, walked into that room, climbed a few steps to the top bunk, and then waited. As an adult, I would be telling everyone about my experience. But even that age, I felt almost silly to be talking about something in which I really had no evidence for. It's funny how certain words can remain hidden from the mind, no matter how blatant or obvious they are. One word that came to my mind last night, lying in the darkness alone, frightened, aware of the rotten change in the atmosphere, a thickening in the air as if something had displaced it. As I heard the first casual twist of the bedsheets below, the first anxious increase of my heartbeat, at the realization that something was once again at the bottom of the bunk, a word in which had been sent into exile, filtered through my consciousness, breaking free of all repression, gasping and screaming, etching and carving itself into my mind. Ghost. As this thought came to me, I noticed that my unwelcome visitor had ceased moving. The bedsheets lay calm and dormant, but they had been replaced by something far more hideous. A slow, rhythmic, rasping breath heaved and escaped from the thing below. I could imagine its chest rising and falling, and each sorted wheezing and garbled breath. I shuddered and hoped beyond all hope that it would just leave. The house lay, as it did the previous night, in a thick blanket of darkness. Silence prevailed all but for the perverted breath of my as yet unseen bunkmate. I lay there terrified. I just wanted this thing to go, to leave me alone. What did it want? Then, something unmistakably chilling transpired. It moved. It moved in a way it didn't before. Then, it threw itself around at the bottom bunk. It seemed unrestrained, without purpose, almost animalistic. This movement, however, was driven by awareness, with purpose, with a goal in mind. For that thing lying there in the darkness, that thing which seemed intent on terrorizing a young boy calmly, nonchalantly sat up. Its labored breathing had become louder as now a mattress and a few flimsy wooden slats separated my body in an unearthly breath below. I lay there, filled with tears, a fear which mere words cannot relate. I would not have believed that this fear could have been heightened. But I was so wrong. I imagined what this thing looked like, sitting there, listening from below upon my mattress, hoping to catch the slightest hint. Imagination then turned to an unnerving reality. I began to touch the wooden slates which my mattress sat on. It seemed to caress them carefully, running what I imagined to be fingers across the surface of the wood. Then with great force, it prodded angrily between two slates, into my mattress. Even though there was padding, it felt as though someone was viciously sticking their fingers into my side. I let out an almighty cry, and the wheezing, shaking, and moving thing in the bunk below replied by kindly and violently vibrating the bunk, as it done the night before. Small flakes of paint powdered into my blanket from the wall. Once again, I was bathed in light. There stood my mother, loving and caring as she always was, with a comforting hug. 
and calming words which eventually subdued the hysteria. Of course she asked me what was wrong, but I could not say. I dared not say. I simply said to no one over and over again. Nightmare. The pattern continued for weeks, if not months. Night after night, I would awaken to the sound of rustling sheets. Each time I would scream, so as to not provide the abomination with the prod to feel me. With each cry in bed, I would shake violently, stopping for the arrival of my mother, who would spend the rest of the night in the bottom bunk, seemingly unaware of the sinister force torturing her son nightly. Along the way, I managed to feign an illness a few times to come up with a less than truthful reason to sleep in my parents' bed. But more often than not, I would be alone for the first few hours of each night. If the room where the light would come outside did not sit right alone with that thing. With time, you can become desensitized to almost anything, no matter how horrific. It had come to realize that, for whatever reason, the thing could not harm me when my mother was present. I am sure the same would be for my father, but as loving as he was, waking him from sleep was almost impossible. After a few months, I had grown accustomed to a nightly visitor. Do not mistake this for some unheartly friendship. I detested the thing. I still feared it greatly, as I could almost sense its desires. One filled with a perverted and twisted hatred and longing for me. My greatest fears were realized in the winter. The days grew short. Longer nights merely provided this wretch of more opportunities. It was a difficult time for my family. My grandmother, a wonderfully gentle woman, had deteriorated greatly since the death of my grandfather. A mother was trying her best to keep her in the community as long as possible. However, dementia is a cruel degenerative illness, robbing a person of their memories one day at a time. Soon she recognized none of us, and it became clear she needed to be moved to a nursing home. Before she moved, my grandmother had a particularly difficult few nights, and my mother decided that she could stay with her. As much as I love my grandmother and felt nothing but anguish for her illness, to this day I feel guilty that my first thoughts were not her, but that nightly visitor that may do things in my mother's absence. Her presence being the one thing I was sure was protecting me from the full horror of this thing's reach. I rushed home from school that day and immediately wrenched the bedsheets and mattress. I rushed home from school that day and immediately wrenched the bedsheets and mattress from the lower bunk, removing all the slates and placing an old desk of chest drawers and some chairs, which kept the cupboard where the bottom bunk used to be. Um, I told my father I was making an office, which he found adorable. But I'd be damned if I'd give that thing a place to sleep for one more night. As darkness approached, I lay there, knowing my mother was not in the house. I did not know what to do. My only impulse was to sneak into her jewelry box and get a small crucifix, which I had seen there before. While my family were not religious, at that age I still believed in God, and hoped that somehow he would protect me. Although fearful and anxious, while gripping the crucifix under my pillow tightly in one hand, sleep eventually came. And as I drifted off into a dream, I hoped that I would awaken this morning without an incident. Unfortunately, this night was the most terrifying of all. I woke gradually. The room was once again dark. As my eyes adjusted, I could gradually make out the window, and the door, and the walls, and some toys on a shelf. Even to this day, I shudder when I think of it. For there was no noise no rustling of the sheets, no movement at all. The room felt lifeless. Lifeless, yet not empty. The nightly visitor, that unwelcome, wheezing, hate-filled thing that terrorized me at night after night, was not at the bottom bunk. It was in my bed. I opened my mouth to scream, but nothing came out. Utter terror had shaken every sound of my voice. I lay motionless. I couldn't scream. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to let it know I was awake. 
I had not yet seen it. I could only feel it. It was obscured under my blanket. I could see its outline. I could feel its presence. But I dared not look. The weight of it pressed down on top of me, a sensation I will never forget. When I say that hours passed, I do not exaggerate. Laying there, motionless in the darkness, I was every bit scared and frightened. If it had been during the summer months, it would not have been light by then. But the grasp of winter is long and unrelenting. And I knew it would be hours before sunrise, a sunrise which I yearned for. I was a timid child by nature, but I reached a breaking point, a moment where I couldn't wait anymore, where I could survive under this intimidately deviant abomination no longer. Fear can sometimes wear you out, make you threadbare, a shell of nerves leaving you only the slightest trace behind. I had to get it out of my bed, then I remembered the crucifix. My hand still lay underneath the pillow. But it was empty. I slowly moved my wrist around to find it. Menemache, as best as I, s as I could, but it could not be found. I either knocked it off the top bunk, or it had. I could not even think of it. Been taken from my hand? Without the crucifix, I lost any sense of hope. Even at such a young age, you can be acutely aware of what death is, and intensely frightened of it. I knew I was going to die in bed if I lay there dormant, passive, doing nothing. I had to leave the room behind, but how? Should I leap from the bed and hope that I make it to the door? What if it is faster than me? Maybe I should slip out of the top bunk, hoping not to disturb my uncanny bedfellow. Realizing that it had not stirred when I moved, trying to find the crucifix, I began to have the strangest thoughts. What if it was asleep? It hadn't so much as breathed since I woken up. Perhaps it was wrestling it, believing that it finally got me, that I was finally in its grasp, or perhaps it was toying with me. After all, it had been doing it just countless nights, and now, with me under it, pinned against the mattress, no mother to protect me. Maybe it was holding off, savoring its victory until the last possible moment. Like a wild animal savoring its prey, I tried to breathe as shallowly as possible, and mustering every ounce of courage I could. I reached over slowly, with my right hand, and began to peel the blanket off me. What I found under those covers almost stopped my heart. I did not see it, but as my hand moved, the blanket. It brushed against something, something smooth and cold. Something which felt unmistakably like a gaunt hand. I held my breath in terror. I was sure it must now know that I was awake. It did not stir. It felt dead. After a few moments, I placed my hand carefully further down the blanket and felt a thin, poorly formed forearm. My confidence an almost twisted sense of curiosity grew as I moved my hand down further to a disproportionately longer bicep muscle. The arm was outstretched lying across my chest, with the rustling hand on my left shoulder, as if it had grabbed me in my sleep. I realized that I would have to move this cadaverous appendage if I even so much as hoped to escape its grasp. For some reason, the feeling of torn, ragged clothing on my shoulder of the nighttime invaders stopped me in my tracks. Fear once again swelled in my stomach and my chest as I recoiled my hand in disgust. It was subtle, but its grip on my shoulder and across my body strengthened. No tears came, but God, how I wanted to cry. As its hand and arm slowly coiled around me, my right leg brushed against the long, cool wall my bed lays against. Of all that happened to me in that room, this was the strangest. I realized that this clutching, rancid thing, which drew great delight from violating the young boy's bed, was not entirely on top of me. It was sticking out from the wall like a spider 
striking from its lair. Suddenly, its grip moved from a slow tightening to a sudden squeeze. It pulled and clawed my clothes, as if frightened that the opportunity would soon pass. I fought against it, but its emaciated arm was too strong for me. Its head rose up, writhing and contouring under the blanket. I now realized where it was taking me. Into the wall. I fought for dear life. I cried, and suddenly my voice returned to me, yelling and screaming, but no one came. And then I realized why it was so eager to suddenly strike. Why this thing had to have me now. Though my window, that window which seemed to represent so much malice from outside, streaked hope. The first rays of sunshine. I struggled further, knowing that if I could just hold on, it would soon be gone. As I fought for my life, the unearthly parasite shifted, slowly pulling itself up to my chest, its head now poking me from under the blanket, wheezing and coughing and rasping. I do not remember its features, I simply remember the breath against my face, foul and as cold as ice. As the sun broke over the horizon, that dark place, that suffocating room of concept was washed, bathed in sunlight. I passed out as its scrawny fingers encircled my neck, squeezing the very life from me. I awoke to my father offering me some breakfast. A wonderful sight indeed. I'd survived the most horrible experience of my life until then, and now I moved the bed away from the wall, leaving behind the furniture that it believed would stop the thing. Weeks passed without an incident, yet on one cold, frostbitten night, I had awoken to the sound of furniture, where the bunk beds used to be vibrating violently. I lay there. Sure, I could hear a distant wheezing coming from deep within the wall, finally fading into the distance, but it wasn't a real threat. I've never told anyone this story before. To this day, I still break out in the cold sweat. Call the superstition if you will, but as I said, I cannot discount conventional explanations with such deep paralysis, hallucination, or an overactive imagination. But I can say this, the following year I was given a larger room on the other side of the house, and my parents took this strangely suffocating and elongated place to their bedroom. They said they didn't need a large room, just one big enough bed for a few things. It lasted ten days. I moved up in eleven. You awoke in a cold sweat from your dream, looking around the dim room. You didn't remember anything that happened, except there was just a loud bang at the end. But you passed it off as just a nightmare. It had been a reoccurring nightmare you've been having for quite a few days now. You slowly arose from your bed, preparing your lunch for the day before heading off to work, stopping at a local store to pick up something along the way. As you drove, you reflected on your life, before and now, how your life partner had recently passed away from an unknown cancer at such a young age. How your children had recently graduated from college and were now living their own lives with a decent paying job. And you couldn't help to feel this certain feeling inside. It was like a sickness. It was a feeling of despairing emptiness. You went to your small cubicle and started to work at your small desk. Your job was a fairly decent one that paid well in this day and age considering the economy. But it was so repetitive. It felt like after a while all you were doing was pressing keys over and over, moving your mouse around, and giving it commands on an outdated personal computer. Click, click. 
I had been repeating the same tasks for the past years with no raise or any comfort at home to make you feel better, realizing that you're all, all alone now. After a few hours of this miserable process came lunchtime. You quickly got up, bringing your lunchbox along with you as you moved to where everybody else was eating. Stanley, a co-worker, and a close friend here, waited for you by the water dispenser. He was wearing the usual work attire, a white shirt over a black dress pants and a small red tie. He greeted you happily, as you walked over to him, adjusting his brown glasses. You liked Stanley. He was a pleasure to chat with, at least at first, but the dullness settled quickly as well. The two of you had always ended up talking about the same subjects every lunch. You were afraid to admit it, but it was becoming boring that everything was, in fact. But you were afraid of how he would react to that, that he just might care too much over you. You didn't want to shock him and surprise him too much. He did, however, speculate that you were becoming increasingly more empty and bitter, but you always assured him that you were fine and he should stop pursuing his questions. After a few minutes of his worthless congression, you set off to eat your lunch for the day. It was always the same thing every day, ham sandwich with a banana. Sometimes he brought a soda, other times it was just a mere water bottle. A few years ago, back when your loved one was still roaming the earth, she would sometimes throw in something else. Even if it was something plain and simple, like a pickle, you always got the light over it. It was a break from the same food every day. Nowadays, you didn't even have the time to throw in something extra, but you were certain that you had quite a surprise for that day. You consumed your sandwich very quickly without hesitation, with your fruit to follow. Nobody seemed to notice how fast you were eating your food. It was almost too easy, you thought. This is when you usually returned to the cubicle and got back to work. But today, you had to do a little extra. From your bag, you withdrew a small handgun you had just picked up from your last paycheck earlier that morning. Nobody noticed it for a few seconds, before a woman started to scream and point at the sight of that revolver. Some of them begged you to stop, reaching out to you. They were trying to talk you into not doing it. You barked at them, making empty threats that you would not shoot anybody as long as they don't get in within touching distance. You felt bad about it. You were a really nice, caring person. One of them quickly phoned the police, saying they were going to get you help. They didn't care. The dullness and melancholy, the emptiness, it all has to end. You looked at the crowd, Stanley standing out in front. He pleaded to you, begging you to reconsider your thoughts and actions. He offered to help you. Without saying a word to him, you opened your mouth and you placed the pistol inside of it. You heard the masses scream before your vision faded to black as you pulled the trigger. You awoke from a cold sweat from your dream, looking at the dim room with a fright. You didn't remember anything that happened except the loud bang at the end. You passed it off as just a nightmare. It had been a reoccurring nightmare you've had for a couple days now. You slowly arose from your bed, preparing lunch for the next day before heading off to work, stopping at a local store to pick up something along the way. You're home alone, and you hear the news about a profile murderer who's on the loose. You look around, sliding the class doors in your backyard, and you notice that there's a man standing out in the snow. He fits the profile of the murderer exactly, and he's smiling at you. You gulp, picking up the phone, to your right, dialing 911. You look back at the glass as you press the phone to your ear, and you notice he is much closer to you now. You then drop the phone in shock. There are no footprints in the snow. It's his reflection.
It was simple, we thought. Take a few chromosomes, slice them up, put them over there, and hey, perfect human being. I'm still not sure what went wrong. Maybe a miscalculation? A misprocedure? Or maybe something beyond our control? Who knows? We, a few psychologists and colleagues and I, were intrigued by human emotion. Anger, despair, euphoria. Was it possible to lock the mind into one emotion? To lock it into a euphoric state so that sadness or anger would cloud its thought? Theoretically, yes. I won't describe the procedures of our experiments to you. Both because I wouldn't want you to repeat them, but also I fear I'll go mad if I have to recount them. The terrible things we did. We were ambitious, useful, nothing could stop us, and no one could tell us that we were wrong. All I will tell is that we got a hold of a few stem cells, nurtured them into fetuses, and tampered ever so slightly with the genetics. The experiment was called the Angel Man Project. The goal was to create a being who could only feel happiness. But something went wrong. Terribly wrong. Half of the test subjects died unexpectedly, without warning or cause. The remaining half were mostly born hideously distorted. Three were born well. Perfect, we thought. A human with a mental capacity beyond any other due to his locked up euphoric state. They were perfectly normal up to 18 months. That's when the first symptoms appeared. Lack of balance, trouble sleeping and eating, low responsiveness. We all panicked on the inside. But on the outside, we remained calm and continued the project. We should have ended it there. We should have taken those damned subjects and euthanized them and burned them and closed the lab. But we continued. Things only got worse. The subjects' movements became increasingly sporadic, and they could not stand still. They could not utter words. Although they could laugh, and they did so often. Much too often. Not happy laughter, but quiet, almost nervous laughing. Nearly constant. No matter how much pain was inflicted on the subjects, they just merely started to laugh, as if it were mocking you calling your attempts to harm it futile. We expected the subjects to have extra learning capabilities. Quite the opposite occurred. Their mental development was seriously delayed. They couldn't pay attention to something for more than a few minutes before lapsing into a laughing fit. But we continued, hoping that these symptoms would clear up as the children got older. We gave these symptoms happy puppet syndrome. Because the mindless movements of the children made it seem like they were puppets on strings. Five years into the project, we realized there was no hope. We could no longer stand the incessant laughing of these children. As if they knew something we didn't. As if some kind of joke was passed between them. To look at a child and see it twitch sporadically and laugh excessively is a haunting thing. Two of my colleagues have already quit because they couldn't stand it. I never heard of them afterwards. They're most likely dead now. The children had not talked for five years. They only laughed their damned laugh. We went to give them breakfast, and they stared at us with their huge eyes, twitching, giggling, and saying nothing. We lay the meal in front of them and left. The meal was laced with toxins that we'd silently and painlessly kill the subjects. It was a painful thing to do, but it had to be done. However, it would not be that easy. As a friend of mine sat a tray of the food in front of one of the boys, the laughing stopped. The boy looked at my friend, his eyes suddenly dark, dead serious, the laughing gone. They continued to stare at him and twitch for a while. My friend was in shock and would not move. My colleagues and I stood with pen and notepad ready to take notes. Suddenly, my friend fell to his knees, grasping his head and yelling furiously. He appeared to be in tremendous pain. My colleagues and I were so surprised by this, we could do nothing but sit and watch. My friend collapsed on the floor, yelling curses. He jerked violently a few times, and then went limp. I held back the urge to be sick, more successfully than a few of my colleagues. Something about that was not normal. 
A dark presence seemed to tower over us. We immediately sealed the entrance. The boy stopped, looked at the floor, and laughed. He fell to the floor, twitching and rolling about laughing insanely. The others did the same. After a few minutes, the fit ceased, and they stood up, still twitching and giggling. The lights went out. I heard crashes, glass shattering, screams. The most terrifying thing of all were the haunting whispers, coupled with the quiet laughing. When the lights went back on, the subjects were gone. Two of my colleagues lay unconscious beside me, their bodies twisted at odd angles, blood trickling down their drooping mouths. At first, they appeared to be dead. They showed no vital signs, but as I leaned in, I could hear them laughing, ever so slightly. I went to examine my friend. No pulse, no breathing, but he continued to laugh quietly. Me and the remaining colleague closed everything down immediately. Before leaving, we destroyed all of our research and destroyed the whole lab. I lost communication with my colleagues. I presume they're dead. I still feel like I'm being watched. I still hear the laughing, the whispering in my dreams. Sometimes when I awake, when I do, I run, I get up and leave wherever I am. I'm not able to stay in the same place for more than a few days because of this. It spread. The other children were seen with similar symptoms. I have no idea how it spread. It shouldn't be something that spreads. Somebody, somewhere, made something up about disjunction of the 15th chromosome. And they kept people happy and in the dark. For now, the disease was coined Angelman Syndrome. So far, the spawn are not dangerous, but I know the originals still lurk somewhere. I know they're coming for me. I know they'll find me. I accept this. It's what I get for attempting to tamper with nature. I leave this letter here as a warning. They're coming for you too. They're coming for all of us. If you ever hear whispering, laughing at the edge of your hearing, run. If you ever feel as if something stands right at the edge of your sight, but you cannot look at it, run. Also, I warn you this. 1. Do not tamper with what is not yours. 2. Even angels can be demons in disguise. And 3. Do not come for me. I'm as good as dead.